Hi again. Um, so um, I made a video yesterday about what cloaking is and kind of the concepts behind optical cloaking and I was asked in one of the comments to make another video about what is dark matter and I thought it was a really good question. A lot of people don't really know what dark matter is um, and so I figured I would just step in and answer the question while the question was hot. Um, so I imagine that this won't get as much traction as the other one, but that's totally okay. Education should be free and I love answering questions. So what is dark matter? Again, I wrote notes so I don't talk forever. <clears throat> So similar disclaimer, I'm an astrophysicist and part of my education and my teaching career have been um, cosmology based, cosmology being the specific astrophysical study of the universe on like on the universal scale. So it's like the largest astronomical scale possible. It's cosmology, <clears throat> even though I have never been a cosmological researcher personally, one of my close friends, colleagues, teachers, um, what is a cosmologist and so I've, I've been around the cosmology circle for a while um again because i'm from stellar astrophysics and exoplanets and again my cat is in the background so you might hear her um so what is dark matter do we have a clear answer for what it is and what it's made of can we study it in the lab or get direct observations of it the answer is no <laughs> so i'll get what i'm uh I'll get to what I mean in a second, but the evidence for dark matter is implied through galactic rotation curves is where the first evidence of it came from. And so there are a few things we should know about before we get into dark matter. Number one, what do we know about rotational dynamics? And two, what did Vera Rubin find? What do we know about rotational dynamics? Um, rotational dynamics is a topic that introductory physics students hate, but physicists in general grow to love. Um, there are a lot of subtleties involved when, ob when an object rotates that can span from simple to increasingly complex. And for those of you who are, you know, suffering through graduate um, classical mechanics like I have done several times, uh, you know, we're talking about, on the complex side, I'm talking about like um, coordinate system like translation type of things but on the simpler side we're talking about like angular speed you know angular velocity nevertheless rotation is one of those topics that has been studied to the moon and back literally ha 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 so clever <laughs> and it's been used as a staple very frequently in observation in astronomical study in particular rotation and orbital dynamics which are pretty much the same thing but think of it on a different axis um, are key to understanding objects of interest uh, the significant things that come from studying rotational dynamics are angular speed how fast it's going around a circle linear speed how fast it's moving through space at any point in time around the circle radius, you know, like how far away from some object, you know, from some central point is it rotating, and mass just distribution, if you have things that are distributed, like if you have mass, masses that are distributed differently, then you're going to have different types of rotation, like if all the mass is in the center, versus if all the mass is even, like on an even disk, versus a sphere, you get different types of rotation, so these are all really important. For a stronger understanding of rotational dynamics, because I'm not going to go farther into it, but again, I love this topic, I could talk about it forever, um, I would suggest looking in any classical mechanics book for context, um, and so a source I will recommend for free textbook access is a site called LibreTexts physics if you there's a physics section of LibreTex, and it is a collaborative project that aims to create open access to higher educational texts um i use this website a lot for um just referencing things um especially like if you're in a class or you're looking up something that you're like oh well, like i you know i i'm in a quantum mechanics class but i forgot how to do you know some part of I don't know, vector calculus, you know, something that you like don't have the textbook for anymore. Um, you can come back and go to LibreText and look stuff up and just find, you know, essentially a free textbook that has all the information and 
I think textbooks should be free because if you are a person who have ever who's ever had to pay for a textbook, they're really expensive and that sucks. <laughs> On to part two. What did Vera Rubin find? This part is a little bit of a history lesson. It's more history than it is like pure facts, but it's very interesting. So a paper came out in 1979 by Vera C. Rubin entitled The Rotational Properties of 21 SC Galaxies with a Large Range of Luminosities and Radii from NGC 4605, Radius 4 Kiloparsecs to UGC 2885, Radius 122 Kiloparsecs was the title. So Rubin studied galactic rotation curves a lot in the late 70s. And in this paper, she noticed something about their rotation curves. Um, <clears throat> and by rotation curve, what I'm referring to is this very specific plot where you plot the uh, angular velocity on the y and on the x you have radius. And so you could say like how far, depend. you just measure different parts of the galaxy in this case you measure how fast it is moving depending on how far away you are from the radius is kind of the was what i'm calling a rotation curve um and we we can find out how fast something's moving towards or away from us using the doppler shift in light we use this all the time um we call it redshift blue shift in astronomy but it's just the doppler effect but um, you're probably more familiar with the Doppler effect from like sound waves, but the same thing works with light waves because waves is waves and that's why we like waves. <laughs> um, so I really, I'm, I know I like super just hand waved like something very crucial, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep moving to keep it a little bit brief. She was able to measure the speeds using redshift blue shift. Um, using spectra. Oh my god, I'm not gonna get into it. I could, again, mm -mm -mm, I could say a lot there, but we'll keep it brief. <clears throat> so she was looking at the rotational velocity of the galaxies at different radii with the expectation that it would taper off over distance. Essentially that the outermost part of the galaxy would rotate slower than the innermost part of the galaxy. That was what we expected. Um, what was found observationally instead was that the velocity did not drop off at the farther radius, but rather stayed mostly con constant. So there was a part where it, like, you know, it would peak, it would drop a little bit, but it would just kind of flatten out. And that was weird. We expected it to be like, you know, a trend and it didn't trend. It kind of stopped trending. So what was up? <laughs> How could this be? So the reason that the velocity was expected to drop off at a farther radius was due to the expected mass distribution of what was visible. Based on the luminous mass, the mass that we can see, there shouldn't be enough to show such rotation curves, but this was not true. Like, based, so basically we, with all the mass we saw, the whole galaxy we saw, there should not be enough mass to let the outermost part of the thing rotate as fast as it was rotating. It was rotating too fast. There's this quote from the paper that explains everything. I'm just gonna read it verbatim. This form for the rotation curves implies that the mass is not centrally condensed, but that significant mass is located at large r. The mass is not converging to a limiting mass at the edge of the optical image. The conclusion is inescapable that non-luminous matter exists beyond the optical galaxy. It is inescapable that non-luminous matter exists beyond the optical galaxy. I just wanted to reiterate that sentence, which is scientific history right there. Insane. That's a crazy state. That's a crazy statement to say, but I love it. Um, so in essence, Rubin found that there was missing mass in the galaxy. And we called it missing mass for a while, and it was then renamed to dark matter. Essentially, matter that is there, we see there's, there's like a gravitational presence of matter, but we can't see it. It's the opposite of luminous matter. So that's where the term dark matter comes from. That's kind of where we started thinking about it. Um, but what is it? <laughs> you know, what is dark matter, actually? Um, so dark matter is something we have not made a direct measurement of. And again, I so the paper that I was just referencing came out in 1979. So we've essentially known about this since the 70s, since the 80s. Let's just be honest, the 70s was mostly done. 
and we still have not made a direct measurement of dark matter. So most people, um, particularly particle astrophysicists, um, think it's some type of particle that we don't know about, some new mystery particle, and there are a lot of candidates for that. Um, and so it's they think it's a particle we don't know about, one that's more massive than a standard baryonic matter particle. Um, baryonic matter just refers to matter that we understand, the matter that we're made of, that we can see, that we have measured, we call it baryonic matter as opposed to dark matter. <clears throat> So it's more massive than standard baryonic matter, yet it doesn't interact with anything else. <laughs> it only has gravitational effects, but it doesn't affect other things. Like it doesn't have a charge. We're not seeing like, oh, there's more dark matter because there's a huge bigger electric field. Like we're, we're not seeing that, just gravitational. It's a, it's a mystery, it's a very big mystery. And I'm, you know, very curious to see what goes on <laughs> in the next, 40 years about what, what's going on with dark matter. Um, so there's a lot of candidate particles from WIMPs to machos, where WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles, and a macho is a massive compact halo object. And there are many ongoing searches for these particles. Um, we don't have a lot of direct observation of dark matter, but there is theoretical evidence for the existence beyond just rotation curves. So the Friedman equation is a cosmological equation that is used to determine the shape and distribution of the universe and how it evolves over time. Um, if you have ever been a cosmology student, I bet you've studied the Friedman equation and there's like a simpler version of it. It can get very complicated. It's got a lot of integrals in it. Um, you know, it's kind of a beast, but honestly, if you've studied it though, you can learn so much from this equation. It's kind of insane. Um, so, from the, from the Friedman equation, um, the universe's energy density is roughly, I'm sorry, I'm playing with my hair, <clears throat> is roughly 70% dark energy, 25% dark matter, and 5% baryonic matter. So it's important to keep in mind that I just used the term, I, or right now I'm talking about dark matter, and, I just, and not dark energy in this current session of talking. They sound similar, but are not the same. But like... Keep that in mind that what we understand and can see is roughly about 5% of the like energy density of the universe. I was gonna say galaxy, but no, the universe, <laughs> which is kind of wild. Like 70% is dark energy, 25% is dark matter, and then we've got 5% that like we can see. So, you know, it just gives you a weird perspective on like, what we understand, right? Like what we can perceive as little tiny human glee globs on a little rock flying through space. I love it, I love it. So that's my brief introduction to dark matter and like what it is. I know there's like, there's so much I could say. There's a lot to say here. Um, I wanted to keep it brief on in terms of like, I don't understand where everyone's math level is at, um, so I don't want to like go heavy into math or go heavy into like certain topics that will just like go over your head. So um, yeah, this was a hand wavy section. My cat's here. Um, but for more information, I would suggest um, chapter eight of my friend Dr. Kim Koble's textbook, Big Ideas in Cosmology. Um, that's the book that I used when I was learning cosmology at an introductory level and you can get free access to it on Libra texts. So it's free, but chapter eight is all about dark energy or dark, sorry, it's not about dark energy. It's about dark matter. There's another chapter about dark energy. Also, the whole book is very good. It's really like, it's a introductory level cosmology, like textbook. Um, but there's little interactive things. It's kind of fun to look at. It does a lot of like helps you go through the derivation and the historical context for a lot of stuff. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, check it out. I will put a link like I did last time. Um, so yeah, like last time, um, my references should hopefully be in the video, but I'll also put them in a comment or in a video description. And um, I'll also put some resources in there because it's, you know, good to have resources. Free resources are the best. And um, that's 
it. I hope you learned something. I hope it was, you know, worth your while. I feel like dark matter is a cool topic. This was really brief, but um, yeah, let me know. If you have any other questions, again, just even freaking drop a comment. I'm like down to answer questions all the time. As long as I have expertise or some level of understanding. If I don't know anything, I won't I won't answer the question, but I could maybe point you to someone who can. So <laughs> ah, Okay, bye.